Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, question and answer sessions on COVID-19 organized by Science Communication Hope Nigeria. I am Omar from uh, Malaysia, uh, University of Putra, Malaysia. I'm a PhD student uh, in Malaysian Genome Institute studying a PhD in genetics. Uh, with us here, we have our panel of experts uh, who are from Nigeria also. Uh, one of uh, the experts is uh, Dr. Jamil. I will briefly um, read uh, his background for you. Dr. Jamil is an expert epidemiology who will be answering your questions on COVID-19 today, holds a bachelor and master's degree in medicine and public health, and has a vast experience working for the National Malaria Elimination Program in Nigeria. He has also contributed significantly to the development of several malaria cases, management guidelines, and training materials for Nigeria. Dr. Jamilu was also involved in several disease outbreak responses in Nigeria and has served in National Emergency Operating Center, EOC, for cerebrospinal meningitis, cholera, uh, lesser fever, and yellow fever outbreaks. You are welcome to the studio, Dr. Jamil. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. The next in our finals of expert is Dr. Owl, who is currently based in Japan. Uh, Dr. Owl is a senior lecturer who is also uh, uh, going to be with us to answer your questions on COVID-19 today, holds a PhD in biochemistry from University KwaZulu, Natal, South Africa, and has decades of experience working for Amadevela University, Zaria. He is currently working as a research fellow at the National Institute for Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, Japan. Dr. Mohammed Awal has also more than 70 papers in peer review scientific journals and serves as a reviewer for many national and international journals. You're welcome, Dr. Awal, uh, joining us in these sessions to answer questions for our followers uh, in Nigeria uh through science communication hub thank you so um the questions today we are going to start with dr jamil who is the first speaker uh the questions will be oh, sorry like this so uh, uh the questions we receive are here so i'll be posting them uh, one of these questions is asking uh my question is does heat prevent the spread of coronavirus or not are black people protected? Okay, thank you very much for the question. And once again, thank you very much for having you in this uh, very important program. Um, uh, this question is a very important question and has been trading for some while since, since the onset of this outbreak. Um, there have been uh, so many discussions, especially at the, early on, at the onset of the outbreak when it was only confined in China and later in Europe and some part of America, whether maybe uh, during hot se uh, heat season, especially tropical weather in uh, Africa and some part of uh, the world, maybe Middle East, that uh, it may limit the spread of uh, the virus. Um, but however, uh, based on what we know about the virus now, um, it has been long for more than, we've been having this virus for more than uh, four months now, and it has spread to almost all the countries of the world. So what is very clear now is that uh, this virus uh, doesn't respect uh, borders and also uh, temperature. Uh, it has been, uh, this virus has been part of spreading in so many areas of the world, so many parts of the world uh, with low temperature and as uh, with uh, areas with uh, high temperatures alike. Uh, example, if you remember, uh, it spread in uh, Iran, one of the uh, first countries that was uh, first uh, hard heated. I think it was uh, in February. And then later on, it uh, started um, uh, reaching Africa. Like in Nigeria, we recorded our first case, first case in the last uh, month of February. And throughout March, April, and up to now, we've been having uh, cases. And uh, if you observe the temperature keep on rising, the weather becomes hotter uh, as we uh, move from March to May. And uh, what we've been seeing is that we've been seeing increase in the number of cases and deaths due to the coronavirus. 
So uh, what we can say now very clearly is that there is no evidence. In fact, temperature or high temperature does not have any effect with the spread of coronavirus. We should not feel protected because uh, as we have seen now, there are several, in fact, uh, some of the worst cases of uh, coronavirus, for example, in Nigeria, are in places that have uh, high temperature, uh, like in Kano, in Medibri, in Sokoto. So there is only a uh, plausible explanation, uh, reason to say that uh, uh, temperature can affect uh, the spread of coronavirus in Nigeria. Then the second component of the question is uh, whether uh, the black race or the black skin uh, confers some kind of some form of protection against coronavirus. Um, this was also entertained earlier uh, during the pandemic, but it has shown not to be true. Uh, for instance, uh, even though we don't have uh, valid data in Africa and Nigeria because uh, the outbreak is still ab um, above in our countries, but if you look at uh, what happened in other part of the world with <clears throat> substantial black population, for example, in the United States and the United Kingdom, where they have black population, what is uh, what uh, what was very clear is that uh, even in, like in New York, uh, more black people die compared to uh, the proportion of black people that died is higher than that of uh, uh, white people. So the black race um, also is associated with uh, less uh, less infection or less clinical outcome for the severe virus uh, disease, for the for the uh, coronavirus disease that's COVID-19. Instead, it's even associated with uh, high mortality. For example, uh, in UK, based on their variable data uh, so far. Uh, more than 30,000 30, uh, persons died in the UK uh, due to the coronavirus. And based on their analysis of the people that died, uh, black people are um, four times more likely to die from uh, coronavirus than white people. So blacks, uh, and also an example in the United States, uh, in the state of uh, Chicago, uh, black constitute about 30% of the population in, uh, in that state. But uh, so far, among the people that died, about 70% of people that died in that state they are blacks. So there's no any association with uh, uh, less clinical, less severe outcome with the black race. So uh, the most important thing is for everybody to adhere to the uh, those uh, proven prevention methods so that you don't get the impression in the first place before we start thinking of severe disease and death. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Awal, for answering our questions on this. Um, the next is uh, Dr. Awal, we are heading to you. Uh, we have uh, questions like this. Uh, someone is asking, what is the truth about the newly discovered drug from Madagascar? <clears throat> okay. Uh, once again, uh, Umar, uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I'm glad to be invited to this uh, platform. Uh, it's a very, truly very interesting question because uh, it's a topic that is very trending. In fact, not only in Africa, in the whole world. And... Uh, it makes it even more important in Africa because of the fact that so many countries are trying to adopt uh, or claiming they will adopt this drug for the treatment of their COVID-19 uh, patients. However, before we know whether it is true, uh, whether it's genuine or not, we need to, it's important for the audience to understand uh, I think the processes that are involved in the drug development so that we can eventually rationally arrive at a position considered or not. Now, basically, uh, in drug uh, discovery and development, uh, there are five distinct stages. Uh, usually, the first stage involves uh, getting into the lab, conducting experiments, and then you identify a candidate that has the potential to treat a particular disease. Now, once you identify that candidate in the lab, that is when you now also, that is the first step, that is the discovery stage. You now identify it as a potential candidate. Then you now have to subject that candidate to the next step, which is the preclinical stage. In the preclinical stage, what basically happens is that you subject the the that candidate to testing in a test tube uh, that is what you call an in vitro analysis and then at that same stage you also try to subject it to testing in suitable animal models and that is what we call uh, in vivo analysis now when the result of this preclinical stage is positive 
then you now say yes you can now proceed to the third stage which is clinical research or clinical trial stage now at this third stage it actually basically involves the use of human participants and uh, the clinical trial stage usually is is is, is subcategorized into uh, three different phases we have the phase one, which basically involves the evaluation of safety and the doses that will potentially be used. And then the phase two, which eventually involves uh, testing for efficacy and side effects using small number of human participants. And then uh, the phase three is the one that you also test for efficacy and you also monitor adverse reaction, but using a very uh, very large uh, population size. Now there is also phase four in some cases. Then after this, uh, uh, the, 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 the drug or the candidate would give a very positive result. The outcome of the clinical trial is positive. That is when you now proceed to fourth stage. That is what you call the FDA review and approval. It will pass through that stage. Once it passed that stage, if successful, the FDA will approve it. And then from there, you can say we have a drug. And then the, the last stage, which is the fifth stage, is actually post-market uh, safety surveillance. Now, those are the processes involved in conventional drug discovery and development. Uh, the entire process, uh, usually takes an average of 12 years. And the success rate, especially at the clinical trial stage, uh, is usually around uh, 5 to 13%. And that actually depends on the source of the information from 5 to 13%. Meaning if you start with uh, uh, 100 uh, candidates, you are likely to only end up with uh, successful 13 candidates. Now, that is why for now, even if you go to drug bank, you will realize that we have about, as of now, I think we have about 445 uh, registered clinical trials for COVID-19 and some associated related uh, conditions. This is to, to allow us to have as much as possible candidates because of the problem of the low success rate at the drug discovery stage, at the clinical trial stage. And for now, some have started recruiting, some have gone far, uh, some are yet to recruit. Uh, classical case, I think a result has been released for hydroxychloroquine yesterday, and uh, it's not very even encouraging, meaning, again, pointing to the issue of the success rate. Now, because of these problems, scientists now came up with so many alternatives so as to accelerate this complex process. It, need, it has to take 12 years, but we need to accelerate it. Two concepts, uh, sorry, one of the first concepts that comes up is actually what we call the drug repurposing and drug repositioning uh, strategies. In drug repurposing, you have an approved drug that is used for the treatment of another disease is now investigated against the new disease. And that is the strategy that is being used in the case of chloroquine now, for example. And uh, in the case of drug repositioning, you have a drug that has failed in another disease trial. Then you try to see whether you can reposition it in the, for in the, the new disease. That is the strategy that was used in the case of uh, remdesivir, for example. Now, that is the next stage, alternative stage to accelerate drug discovery. Now, the next, al the other alternative to accelerate the drug discovery process actually has to do, is, has to do with what you call reverse pharmacology. But this is actually less popular and is it applies mostly to traditional medicinal plants. Uh, in reverse pharmacology, usually it is based on documented use of plant materials that are used in traditional medicine by a group of people for a very long period of time without report of any toxicity. That is, that is 
the starting point. Now, with this information, you can start scientific investigation into the therapeutic potency, into the ability of the drug. You try to validate that information using scientific concept, but you can start it from the clinic to the lab. That is, uh, you start from the bent, sorry, from the bedside, and then you come to the lab. In the lab, that is when you test for the chemical components, the the mechanism of action, and so on and so forth. So you are actually taking it not from the lab to the clinic, but rather from the clinic to the lab. Now, these are the approaches that are used. Uh, in the case of <laughs> Madagascar COVID-19 herbal mixture, certainly the conventional drug discovery approach is not the one that was used. And if it, it is, or it was a reverse pharmacology approach that was used, there are also standard guidelines for reverse pharmacology. And those, also, those guidelines also involve very robust uh, clinical trials. And for now, we are not sure whether such clinical trial was conducted. And even if they are conducted, then at least we need to see the scientific community need to see the data. When the data is examined, is scrutinized, then it can be validated. And also, of course, after being validated, the outcome of the trial has to be also positive. As when we have that, that is when we can now say, we can now subject it to review, and then we can now say we have a drug. So for now, Unfortunately, there is no data coming from Madagascar apart from the newspaper. There is no scientific data. And unless this data is scientifically available, we cannot say we have a drug. But meanwhile, I'm truly glad, glad that uh, the African Union is also requesting the Mag Madagascar Authority to provide uh, the technical data for scientific validation. And I'm also glad that I think I read the Madagascar Authority has also recently contacted uh, some scientific uh, uh, institutes in South Africa for investigation of the, the drug. So unless all these things have been properly articulated, we cannot say we have a drug. It's too early. Uh, also, let me just add in case somebody read somewhere that uh, the Madagascan COVID-19, uh, the one of the main ingredients is actually Artemisia annua. Uh, and people have already, I can see, it's already trending in the social media cycle that it's just Artemisia annua, take it. Yes, Artemisia annua is actually the mainstay of the anti-malaria chemotherapy. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Artemisia annua, is actually uh, the atomicinin, which is the mainstay of anti-malaria uh, anti chemotherapy, is actually uh, derived from uh, Artemisia annua. And also in 2015 down, some Chinese scientists have clearly shown that plant extracts of the, the Artemisia annua is actually uh, active against SARS, not SARS-CoV in vitro. Uh, SARS is actually like a cousin to the present SARS-CoV-2. And, but even at that, that plant was not, even at that, in that cousin, in that experiment, the plant was not tested using animal models or humans. And so with what I've said about low success rate at clinical trial stage, it's very risky to also try to, to, to extrapolate the findings of that experiment to the present SARS-CoV-2 situation. Because that is what I've read, people are trending, they are, they are, they are using that as, as uh, explanation that it can work. It's very hard because that was done in an in vitro situation, no animal test, no human test, and no clinical trial. And so it's difficult to also make the same extrapolation. So the true situation, uh, with the Madagascar drug, we need to, if 
a clinical trial has been done and the, the trial should be available for scientific scrutiny and validation. Then as soon as that is done and the result is clearly shown or proved to be positive, then we can say we have a drug. Otherwise, for now, we need to wait for more scientific investigation before we can truly confirm the validity of the Madagascan drug claims. That is the situation now. That is, I think, what is the, the true situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Awol, for these clear explanations. Uh, hope the followers get the points. Uh, let me hover over to Dr. Jamil for the next questions. The questions we got is, uh, is it true that COVID-19 can be asymptomatic? If yes, then why? Does it mean the symptoms will not manifest at all? All right, thank you very much for this question. Um, this question is uh, very important and uh, it's very good for everybody to be clear about the symptomatology of uh, COVID-19 because it's causing a lot of confusion especially in some, in some of our societies. Uh, uh, some people are having some doubt about the existence of disease uh, when some people have been tested and then they are found to be negative and those uh, people are either not presenting with symptoms or they are presenting with uh, a very mild or mild to moderate symptoms that uh, does not uh, look like they are having a very serious disease. So in reality, uh, COVID-19, the symptoms is a spectrum uh, from um, no symptoms at all to a severe disease, a very severe disease that may even um, require admission into uh, intensive care unit and uh, use of uh, ventilators to aid uh, a patient's breathing. So um, what, uh, what, uh, technically what is used to uh, divide or classify the symptoms of uh, or manifestation of COVID-19, there are three uh, classes. We have what is called atypical, uh, what we could call typical symptoms. So for typical symptoms of uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, as COVID-19 is a respiratory tract virus that affects the respiratory tract, the respiratory tract. So patients usually present with cough or difficulty in breathing and then with fever. These are the typical uh, 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 symptoms for COVID-19. Then we have uh, atypical symptoms. Uh, some patients may have these uh, typical symptoms uh, with some atypical symptoms. So these atypical symptoms may include uh, body weakness. Sometimes some people may have uh, vomiting, some may have diarrhea, some may have conjunctivitis, that's uh, inflammation of the eyes, and then the eyes may be rubbed. Some may have skin rashes, some may have uh, discoloration of their legs or their foot or hands. So all these are atypical symptoms. So now we've uh, discussed two class, those with typical symptoms, those with atypical symptoms, and then there are those with uh, pre-symptomatic uh, disease. Sometimes uh, somebody is diagnosed early before he started manifesting disease. So they are called pre-symptomatic. So they may not be symptomatic at the time of diagnosis, but they may later um, uh, develop symptoms as the disease progress. And then there are, the last group are the group that are entirely asymptomatic from beginning to end. They don't have any symptoms, and they, will have, and they still have the virus in the system, and they have the ability to... Uh, uh, transmit the virus to other individuals. So, and um, uh, this in the, these asymptomatic uh, people are very important. If you remember, uh, if you can recall, in the news in the last few days, there have been serious uh, protests in some of the our treatment centers in some states. Uh, in some states, there are protests. Some they even block roads. Or there's some in some uh, treatment centers, the uh, production videos uh, saying that uh, they are nothing is uh, they don't have, they don't feel anything they don't feel anything, and that uh, people are just keeping them for some sake. So it's very important for this patient and even the general public to know that uh, uh, COVID-19 can present with those symptoms, or sometimes you may even have the disease and can be pre-symptomatic. And um, this, uh, it's like a double-edged sword, this asymptomatic uh, stage of COVID or pre-symptomatic. Um, because asymptomatic, because uh, the, those people that are asymptomatic, they're not likely to have severe disease, they're not likely to die. So it's a good, for, it's a good thing for, for people that have these uh, symptoms. And also at the, at the other end, that's the other end of the sport, the other end of the sport, uh, those symptoms, those uh, kind of individuals uh, can transmit the disease. And if they come in contact with some people, they can transmit the disease. And if uh, and sometimes they can transmit the disease to some people at high risk of having severe disease, which they can contract the disease and even die from the infection. So what is very critical is for people to know that uh, the disease 
can be asymptomatic, or sometimes you uh, may be in pre-symptomatic phase. So uh, the most important thing, uh, what many countries that succeeded in uh, controlling this virus to such a degree did was uh, mass testing, to mass to test uh, the population as much as possible, so that to identify people with symptoms, people with symptoms, to isolate them so that they will not be at uh, risk of spreading disease to the individual. With that, we we'll have a reduction on the uh, spread of the infection. And uh, uh, what uh, if yes, then why? Why is that uh, so many people uh, have uh, the immune system? There are some people that have some what is called pre-existing medical condition. Some people have diabetes, some people have uh, um, heart diseases, uh, some people have uh, hypertension and other conditions. Those conditions on their own uh, weaken uh, the body defense mechanism. So that whenever the body experiences certain insult, it's, uh, the body easily uh, succumb and they may have severe disease and uh, some of them may even die. And that's why if you look at uh, the uh, some analysis, epidemiological analysis that, that was done on uh, COVID-19, people would feel a different condition and people would advance age. They usually succumb to disease because of the weakness in their immune system. For example, in the United States of America, about 80% um, of uh, people that die from COVID-19 uh, people that are above the age of 65. So uh, sometimes if you're young, maybe you are in your 20s or 30s or 40s, and you, um, you may not have severe disease, you may have parents that are elderly, or you may have some loved ones that are elderly, and you can easily spread those disease to, the, to them, and they can get infected. So it's, uh, one, if one is, if, uh, is found to be positive, uh, it's very important that that person should be uh, should isolate, uh, should go to treatment centers, or safe isolate if maybe uh, there are no treatment centers in the facility so that uh, he may not be at risk to, uh, to his society and to his uh, immediate loved ones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. The next questions we will go over to you, uh, Dr. Wall. Okay. Um, the question I was asking uh, why does it take so long to develop the vaccine for COVID 19? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very interesting question. In fact, it's quite uh, thought-provoking. Uh, people have been asking this question for a long time. Uh, but let me start by saying in a very simple language that vaccine simply tells the body system that, hey, get ready. When you see SARS-CoV-2, destroy it. That is basically what vaccine does. And actually, before you do that, you need to understand the virus properly, very well. And unfortunately, this virus is new. It's just, we are just getting the information about the virus now. And, and I'm glad scientific community is doing extremely well, extremely well. We have a lot of information within a very short period of time. That is one of the reasons why it's taking long. We need to understand the virus properly. And then after the virus is understood fully, then an antigen, a suitable or proper antigen needs to be identified. In simple language, uh, it's very simple language, uh, an antigen, so that my audience will understand, an antigen is that portion of the virus that is recognized by the body system. Yeah, it's a portion of the virus that is recognized by the body system so that as soon as the body defense system sees that antigen or that portion, it can easily be destroyed. Uh, so that is that is an antigen in simple language. So an antigen needs to be identified and it also takes some time. Unfortunately, for SARS-CoV-2, it has a very high mutation rate, uh, like most RNA viruses. Uh, mutation, it changes very fast, like most RNA viruses. And all these are actually very important consideration in the identification of any antigen and vaccine development. It needs, we need a lot of time for, to articulate the right antigen for vaccine design. So scientists have to be careful so that we need to because of also because of this high mutation rate we need to produce a vaccine that is that will protect as much people as as possible now after all this this processes understanding the virus identification of antigen they all take time we also the next thing is that we now 
the, 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 the vaccine has to be conceptualized. And once the vaccine has been conceptualized, then it has to be subjected to some stages, as I've explained earlier. After the vaccine has been sub, uh, uh, conceptualized, it has to be subjected to the preclinical research, the clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, then also subjected to the FDA review. And then before we can now say that we have a vaccine. So it, it takes quite a while. For now, I'm glad about 120 vaccine candidates have been proposed, but uh, the ones that are actually leading, that is the good news, the ones that are actually new, uh, leading are actually the genetic vaccines. Uh, the RNA and DNA vaccines, they appear to be leading so far. And that is why, in fact, that is why we are even hopeful of a, DNA, of a vaccine in the next 12 months or so. Uh, otherwise, uh, we may even have to work uh, to it uh, a bit longer. So these are the reason why uh, we need a lot of time. We need to be patient. It takes a lot of time before we can produce a vaccine. It's a gradual, it's a long process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awa. And we go back to uh, Dr. Jamil. The question goes here like this. Uh, since there is no vaccine for COVID-19, which drugs are currently given to those in isolations? Okay, thank you very much for this question. Um, as uh, that, uh, uh, oh, well, rightly said, so far we don't have a safe and effective vaccine and treatment for, and drugs for treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, globally. However, um, uh, if you remember, if we are following events, uh, so many people that uh, are tested positive, even uh, in world countries, especially in Nigeria, uh, move to as uh, or move to designated isolation centers, and then those patients from their testimonies that uh, some are even public, they, they mentioned that they are giving some drugs, so that uh, they are giving some drugs. And then there are several reasons why somebody can be given drugs, even, even though we don't have uh, uh, drugs that is proven to be effective against uh, the virus. Even uh, in world countries, especially in Nigeria. Uh, and then um, for, uh, for now, um, what is the mainstay for treatment? Is what is called standard treatment or symptomatic treatment. So usually in the case, uh, patients are treated based on the symptoms they present. So, for example, uh, since it's a respiratory vir uh, virus, uh, some patients may, may present with difficulty in breathing. If a patient is with difficulty in breathing, uh, whatever from whatever cause, if uh, that patient is given oxygen, that patient usually will usually get relief and uh, will feel better. And some of the patient may present with uh, fever or body pains or body weakness, and those patients will present with uh, will benefit from analgesics, maybe paracetamol or any analgesics that would uh, alleviate the fever or the pains they're having. Some of them may present with uh, diarrhea. And if patient has diarrhea for some time, for a certain time, they may have dehydration. And those patients, therefore, will require some IV fluid. And because of the respiratory symptoms, uh, there are some medicine that can be given for cough. Uh, some of them, they are orthodox medicine or the conventional medicine that you see in the hospital. And there are also some... Uh, 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 traditional medicine or non orthodox medicine that are also been found to relieve some of these uh, symptoms. So, but most of these medicine that we've been uh, saying, uh, we've been discussing, are medicine that uh, reduce the impact of the severity of the disease. Then um, there are also med some medicine that, are, so far as that I would at least said, there are so many uh, medicine, there are so many candidates that have been considered for treatment of COVID, and that is what is called a clinical trial. Clinical trial. Uh, sort of uh, during when there's any disease or when a drug is uh, in development or when there's outbreak. So certain candidates have, have been found to be uh, active or have been found to be um, clearing the virus in vitro or that or in, in the lab or on um, uh, in the test tube can be used uh, to treat uh, some certain individuals under some uh, certain control to see whether uh, those virus can also be safe and effective for humans. So in those medicines, uh, what uh, the goal is either to see a virus that can eliminate uh, a drug that can eliminate the virus entirely from the system, or a drug that can reduce, can reduce the severity of the illness, or a drug that can uh, re uh, reduce pro progression, maybe from mild to moderate to severe disease. So these are the things 
these are the factors, these are the endpoints that uh, uh, the scientists or the researchers doing these uh, studies are actually looking for. Or, and also uh, another endpoint is uh, to see uh, drugs that when given to patients with critical condition, at critical condition can uh, reduce mortality. So several drugs are under consideration. Uh, if you can remember, there are so many discussions about chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, lenotovirus, Lenotov um, and there have been mixed feelings like for chloroquine. Um, there's, there's a study that was, uh, that was halted in, in Brazil due to the toxicity of a rate of deaths that have been, uh, that been, have been discovered in patients that are receiving those treatments. So even though uh, chloroquine is a medicine that is readily available, especially in some, Af in some um, part of Africa, so people should, uh, should, be, should, uh, should not take those drugs on some medication. Um, uh, there have been several inc incidents of chloroquine poisoning, including that people that have taken overdose of uh, chloroquine. So even though uh, certain uh, drugs, these drugs, uh, uh, they have been tried even in Nigeria, but uh, let uh, we should, people should allow expert, medical expert to uh, give those drugs to people that need it so that uh, they will be properly uh, monitored. One drug that has been found uh, to be somehow uh, effective uh, in, in, current, um, in reducing patient symptoms is a drug known as Remdesivir. I think it was mentioned by the owl earlier. It was, uh, it was a repurposed drug, a drug that was init, uh, initially uh, uh, developed for Ebola, but it was not been found to be uh, too effective on Ebola. But uh, so far, it's somehow effective on uh, patients with COVID-19. Uh, the US FDA, what they call the FDA, what they call Food Drugs and Administration, have approved drugs for use uh, in the United States. And I think even in Nigeria, it has been said that this drugs is being used for treatment of COVID patients. So what uh, the maybe taken from in summary, uh, so far, they've not been there. There is no drug, known drug that has been found to be safe and effective in clearing the virus, acting on the virus itself to stop the virus replication or to stop mm -hmm. the progression of disease. There have been several uh, candidates that are under consideration. However, there are several uh, medications, several uh, uh, medications that can be given to patients to alleviate their symptoms. And usually, viral infection, uh, uh, medically, they are usually safe limiting. The virus, uh, when you have the infection, your body immune system will build up and then they will start uh, fighting the infection. And if uh, your body immune uh, system was able to overcome the virus, the virus will get cleared in your system and will get better, even with heart treatment. However, uh, those drugs that uh, manage the symptoms are very good in elevating symptoms for people that have those symptoms, like difficulty in breathing, people that are coughing, people that are having dehydration. And you know, COVID can also have, can also lead to uh, kidney failures, can also lead to heart failures. So those patients that have this kind of particular symptoms will uh, benefit from uh, standard uh, treatment for kidney failures and heart conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jamil. The next questions we are going to uh, Dr. Awal. Okay. Uh, the questions uh, was asking, can I rough or apply hand sanitizer on my face <laughs> and not? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question like to, like similar to what uh, actually was trending in the last few weeks about whether you can inject or take uh, sanitizers. Uh, but let me answer this question by saying, by explaining to the audience that actually every drug has an optimal route of administration. That is how it is being administered into the body system. It can be topical, that is on the skin, applied to on the skin, and then some oral through the mouth, some intraperitoneal and intra or intramuscular injections. And so, and there are also there are also other uh, routes of administration. And whenever you change the route of administration of a particular drug, the function or the activity uh, of that drug is likely to be compromised because uh, of the bowel transformation. Largely because of the bowel transformation, the drug undergoes some changes within the body. That's what called uh, bowel transformation. And sometimes even after that process, the, that uh, 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 drug eventually even becomes uh, toxic to the body. Now, in the case of hand sanitizer, 
it is actually aimed to be used in the hands. And like I've said, if you change this thing, you will can now cause a problem. In the case of the hand sanitizer, it's made for the hands, and and if you rub, rub it in the face or the nose, there is highly there is high likelihood that it can get into your body system. And some of the components of these uh, sanitizers are actually toxic to us as humans. Uh, for example, hydrogen peroxide is actually one of the components in some of the sanitizers, and it can cause oxidative stress, which may lead to so many problems in the body. So in a nutshell, it is not advisable for anyone to apply hand sanitizer on the face or the nose. It is actually potentially uh, toxic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awa. Let me hold back to Dr. Jamil. Next, uh, we have the questions uh, goes like this. How can I take care of a relatives with symptoms of COVID-19? Dr. Jamil. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this question. And I think this is a question that uh, I think everyone uh, should be interested in, as we know that the numbers of COVID-19 keep on increasing rapidly in Nigeria. Um, uh, there are now uh, COVID-19 cases in, in virtually all parts of Nigeria. And uh, another challenge that we are having in Nigeria, in most parts of the country, is the testing rate. Um, the testing has been very poor, uh, and especially in so many parts of the country. Uh, they have limited their fewer labs that conduct this uh, COVID-19 test. So in this case, uh, there are so many COVID-19 cases that will happen, that may happen, that uh, may not actually be diagnosed. And, uh, and, those parts, and those persons may be having COVID-19 cases. And uh, if we uh, are following events, we've seen that there are so many um, cases of uh, mysterious death or unusual activity deaths in our communities. Uh, it has been reported in Kano, in Sokoto, in Meduguri, in Nyobe, in Bochi, uh, death especially from elderly. And usually, uh, those, those dates, if you did a little investigation, uh, you've seen that so those patients usually have uh, symptoms of, of uh, COVID-19. So most likely, uh, those uh, dates are related to COVID-19, uh, but uh, they have not been detected because of our limited uh, testing capacities. So one way or the other, we may find ourselves uh, with somebody with COVID-19, confirmed COVID-19, yes, or somebody with symptoms of COVID-19. And also, uh, our treatment centers are also limited. Uh, if you remember last week, uh, there have been discussion in Lagos and even nationally to see whether uh, COVID-19 patients can be treated at home. So in this case, uh, we need to be very aware of how to uh, manage COVID-19 patient, uh, patients. Um, because if uh, patients are not being confirmed, they may not likely to be admitted in treatment centers and they, you may have to admit it in hospitals or sometimes they will be treated at home. So what can we do if you have patients with COVID-19, confirmed COVID-19, or with symptoms or use of COVID-19? That's uh, patients that have recently had fever, cough, difficulty in breathing, or other symptoms of COVID-19 that we mentioned earlier. So the most important thing is for us to, uh, as I mentioned, to maintain, maintain safe distance between us and everybody. So more so to patients with uh, uh, COVID-19 patients uh, with COVID-19. So, uh, so when we have discussion, we, we are expected to wear uh, face masks, even though it's recommended that we would wear face masks. But particularly if you have a person with COVID-19, with symptoms of COVID-19, you should wear either face masks or face covering. It doesn't have to be medical or surgical masks or N95. Any covering that can cover your face, your nose and mouth can uh, protect you from the COVID-19 patient. And always you maintain at least uh, uh, six feet or, see, or like two arms length between you and uh, somebody with uh, COVID-19 patients. And if you are treating that patient at home, uh, it's advisable that uh, you should not, uh, that person should not uh, share room with other people that are not infected so that uh, it will limit the spread of the infection. And they should uh, stay in separate rooms. And even uh, they should not also stay, uh, share household uh, utensils like uh, cups, spoons, and other household utensils that is commonly used by people in the household. And uh, even if, uh, so what is advisable is that uh, if uh, they are to be given food, they can be given food in a disposable, uh, uh, either disposable plate and disposable spoon 
for that immediately after when they use that uh, uh, utensils, it can be destroyed immediately to limit uh, infection. However, in some resource, uh, poor resource settings, uh, they may not be, people may not uh, have the financial capability to uh, be buying, continuously buying uh, uh, disposable um, utensils. They can use the utensils we have at home, at home, but maybe we can dedicate certain utensils for those people that have COVID-19. And then those, those utensils, after use, anything that's been used by COVID-19 patients, uh, uh, the person that will clean it, maybe uh, be it his cloth or any utensils that he frequently use, should use um, warm water. And then uh, probably if I uh, should use hand gloves to wash those uh, utensils, including those things. And then you should avoid uh, to, uh, those utensils touching your bodies. And immediately after handling those uh, utensils, washing them, you should wash your, wash your hands properly with soap and water or with hand sanitizers. Uh, so uh, these are uh, these are this. And then um, um, patients with uh, COVID-19 should not be uh, at homes that have uh, patients with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19 patients should not be receiving visitors. This this is not the time for this. This is the type of illness that uh, people should be coming to see the patients because as they are coming. Uh, they may likely get infected with the uh, with the patients, and the, we keep on spreading the virus. So, as much as possible, uh, there should not be visitors in houses that have uh, COVID nineteen patients, and then uh, there should be frequent disinfection of uh, disinfection of uh, uh, utensils or things that are frequently touched in uh, households that have uh, COVID nineteen patients, uh, like uh, cups, uh, door handles, uh, light switch, tables, uh, any utensils that been touched, especially by the COVID nineteen patient. Should be disinfected. What is disinfection? Uh, you can use either uh, hypo, it's a common disinfection, sodium hypochlorite, or you can use uh, detol, any common disinfection. Uh, you mix it with water and then clean uh, those uh, the surfaces thoroughly um, because those uh, substances have been found to be very active in uh, killing uh, this virus. And also, even bathrooms should not be shared, if possible, should not be shared with uh, somebody with suspected uh, COVID 19 patients. Um, but if uh, circumstances uh, warrant that, uh, maybe if there's maybe if there's maybe only one bathroom in the house, definitely it has to be shared. So in this kind of circumstances, uh, immediately when uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pers uh, infected persons use that bathroom or toilet, that uh, the whole uh, uh, environment should be cleaned thoroughly before anybody uses it to prevent uh, spread of infection. So these are the steps. And then although also people, uh, as I said, people should wear face masks as much as possible. And then they should maintain safe distance. So, and most as possible, also the people that take care of them should also monitor themselves to see whether they've developed COVID-19 symptoms that may require them to get tested and uh, get managed accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Um, the next questions we have uh, goes to Dr. Awal. Can one be infected with COVID-19 through wound or an injury? And can COVID-19 get through an eye? Ah. Uh. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, yes, it is actually conceivable that SARS-CoV-2 uh, can be transmitted through the wound, but so far, it is not known to be to be a way of transmitting the virus. Uh, there is just no evidence so far. No, no. Let me say, no strong evidence so far. Uh, However, the viral RNA, uh, in simple language, the genetic material of the virus, so that my audience will follow, the viral RNA has actually been detected in the blood of the COVID-19 patient. And that is why some group of scientists are now theoretically thinking that it can be wounds, caught injuries, can be a source of Trans, uh, trans, uh, uh, route of transmission of the virus. Uh, however, most uh, respiratory viruses generally are not known to be transmitted through caught wounds, injuries, and so on. And that is also the basis why some scientists believe that it cannot be transmitted uh, through the wounds or cuts. So for now, truly, there is no uh, uh, strong evidence to suggest that the disease can be transmitted through wound and cuts. Uh, we have to wait for conclusive data. Meanwhile, I will advise us that we should all be very careful because the disease is an evolving 
uh, uh, is it is an evolving situation and information. The data we have now can change as the disease evolves. So that's why I advise that people should be uh, very careful. But uh, for now, there is uh, there is no strong evidence. Now, with for the eyes, uh, truly some studies uh, have been conducted uh, along that line also. And they seem to suggest that the eye is also a possible route of transmission. In fact, actually, the World Health Organization has also identified uh, the eyes as also a possible route. This is actually because uh, uh, some Chinese scientists, yes, Chinese, uh, Chinese scientists have shown the presence of the virus in the tear secretions of one out of 32 COVID-19 patients, that is in one study. In another study, another group also detected the viral RNA, that is RNA, that is the genetic material for the virus for the audience. The viral RNA was detected in the, some ocular discharges, that is the eye discharges of one out of 72 uh, COVID-19 patients. And so, they now is now considered actually as a, as a possible route, even though it may be minor. Uh, the percentage is uh, is low, and also because of the fact that the disease disease is also associated with uh, contractivitis, it also points to the fact that uh, it can be transmitted through the the eyes. So that is actually the, the information available so far. And um, I think the who has to a large extent classified it as a possible route of transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awal. And next we go to Dr. Jamil. Uh, this is asking how to go to the market or supermarket to shop safely. All right, thank you very much. Um, this question is very, very important. Uh, one of the slogans for fighting this uh, COVID-19 is uh, stay at home, stay at home. It's very important because if you stay at home, you don't go out, you are not likely to get uh, in contact with somebody that have the virus uh, for, that, for you to get infected. However, um, as the saying goes, mom must work. You can't stay at home for several weeks, or several days or several weeks. One can stop. So one definitely need to go and shop at least uh, uh, things that will sustain lives, uh, like food and other basic essential. So one way or the other, one has to go to markets or supermarkets uh, to do some shopping. So however, so how can we do it safely? Because uh, you know we all know that the market and supermarket is a place where uh, people usually converge, a lot of people converge. And one way or the other, some people, someone that is infected may get into, may get, may be in that market, and you can get, really get infected even after staying several days at home. So how can we simply go to market as well, market? So as much as possible, the ruling is that uh, uh, you should minimize going to market unless it's necessary. When you go to market, stock as much as you can so that you don't need to go to market frequently. And over you are going to market, uh, observe uh, the basic uh, precaution, safety precautions, like uh, you wear face masks. And also when you go to the market as well, market, uh, you maintain social distance and even though uh, we know how our markets are, but as much as possible, you maintain social distances. You should not stay close to each other. And another thing is that, uh, if possible, if you are going to market, uh, you can time yourself to go to markets where people are not, uh, maybe maybe at, at an off-peak period. You know that peak period where a lot of people go to the market at the same time. So if you can target those uh, off-peak period, or if you can target uh, markets that people don't usually frequent, it's better to go to those markets. Uh, so you can go to markets uh, like for uh, maintain social distancing and uh, and all basic precautions. So and also in the market, like in supermarket, they have basket and trolleys. So you know those buckets and trolleys. Usually people use their hands to touch those buckets and trolleys. So before you use those hands, you can uh, disinfect the handles of those uh, trolleys and uh, and baskets before using them to minimize uh, the chance of infection. Because apart from cough, another means of uh, mode of transmission of COVID-19 is through uh, format. If you, if somebody with the virus maybe cough and touch a surface, and you touch uh, that surface, you can, and then uh, later on you touch your face, or especially your uh, nose, mouth, or eyes, you may likely get infected with the virus. So disinfected uh, surfaces with the disinfected, with disinfectants we mentioned earlier. 
so that uh, it will uh, kill the virus. And then uh, <clears throat> after buying those uh, commodities, especially perishable commodities like uh, vegetables and, uh, and fruits, you need to wash them thoroughly uh, with water, like you wash them before. And then after washing them, you wash your hands with soap and water. And uh, what uh, one practices uh, I notice people are doing, which I think can also expose them to danger, is that some people, whenever when they are going out, they wear hand gloves. Uh, it has also been found that wearing hand gloves is uh, protective against uh, COVID-19. And instead, one may actually contaminate certain surfaces with the with his hand gloves, because the hand gloves will give you a sense of sense of uh, safety that at least your hands are safe. You may be touching so many things. And when you're touching, because uh, when they wear this uh, hand gloves, they'll be uh, touching so many things. And uh, with that hand gloves, you may touch some things that when you remove the hand gloves, may be contaminated. And later on, you use your bare hands to, to, those, to touch those things. So as much as possible, uh, you don't need to wear hand gloves when going out. What is important is frequent hand washing, cover your nose, and then uh, whenever you touch something that is potentially contaminated, you wash your hands properly with soap and water with hand sanitizers. And also, uh, when going to market, avoid uh, minimize using uh, banknote or cash. Always, uh, if possible, use uh, bank transfer. Uh, most shops in market now accept bank transfers. Just uh, use a bank code or your bank app to transfer the money. With that, uh, because uh, the money that we extend can also be a potential good where uh, people can get infected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Uh, the same questions goes to you again. Uh, can children? Adolescents, young adults catch COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very important question. Um, uh, COVID-19 is a new virus. Um, what uh, that's why it medically is called a novel virus. It's a virus that was not previously previously seen by scientists before uh, December 2019. So, usually, uh, we humans, when we get exposed to microorganisms, be it virus, bacteria, or any other form of bacteria, microorganisms. Our body uh, defense, uh, uh, defenses uh, defend, uh, develop immunity against the virus, so that whenever you have another exposure, uh, the disease will be less severe. But for COVID-19, virtually nobody has uh, immunity. Nobody has some kind of protection against COVID-19. So uh, everybody has the same chance of getting infected with uh, COVID-19, be it children, adolescents, or, ad uh, or old elderly. However, as I mentioned earlier, the elderly, uh, ad um, children and ad adolescents usually are uh, people that, uh, like social children, they don't actually travel, they don't go out often, and they don't uh, don't expose to several toxins like cigarette or uh, pollutants. Uh, work exposure of adults and elderly will expose them to so many uh, irritants and pollutants that work in their respiratory systems. And also, there's what is called innate immunity. The innate immunity uh, does the natural immunity, or not, not the adapted immunity of uh, the body system. Are usually stronger in adults than in, uh, in sorry in children than adults because as one ages uh, his body uh, system usually start getting weak and also uh, in children and adults uh, there is what is called uh, receptors receptors are the roots or like the dose uh, virus or, or microorganism used to enter our cells or our, our system so usually those receptors are not uh, usually well developed in children and in young adolescents so these are the some of the reasons that uh, we think uh, uh, young, uh, young children and adults, and even though they can also get infected, but then they don't usually present with severe symptoms. So uh, I think the takeoff uh, message is that young adult and or that's adolescent, ad young adult and children can get infected, but usually are not associated with severe form of COVID-19 disease. So usually they have mild infections. However, anybody can die from COVID-19. As I mentioned, like in the United States, it's 80% of people that die are above the age of uh, 65. However, 20% of people that died are below the age of uh, 60, 65. People in their 50s, in their 40s, in their 30s, in their 20s, some even teenagers dying from COVID-19. So just because you are you have less likelihood of getting um, infected, you should not feel uh, you are invisible or you are protected. You should protect yourself as much as possible so that even if, uh, so that even uh, apart from not getting infected, you can you can get if uh, you, you should not get infected and go and infect mm -hmm. people that are elderly or people that have certain pre-existing medical condition that uh, may have uh, likely, uh, more likely to have severe disease that may lead to their death uh, from COVID-19 uh, infection. 
So children can have disease, but they have likelihood of having a severe form of disease. But can also young adults can also transmit disease to other individuals. So they, everybody needs to be very careful. Everybody needs to adhere to public health measures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. We head over to uh, Dr. Awal. The next question is, uh, we heard that ulcer and other symptoms of heart attack could also be a sign of COVID-19. How true is this? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. The symptoms of ulcer are basically heartburn, stomach pain, nausea, belching, and um, others. Uh, but uh, none of these symptoms actually is listed uh, by scientists or by the uh, WHO that it is a symptom of COVID-19. And therefore, uh, ulcer is actually not a symptom of uh, COVID-19. Uh, in the case of uh, heart attack, uh, there are one symptom, uh, sorry, two symptoms, difficulty in breathing, and some chest pain. Uh, the heart attack is associated with also difficulty in breathing. It's also sometimes associated with chest pain. Uh, these are also some uh, symptoms of uh, COVID-19. However, in the case of heart attack, usually it's associated with uh, swelling, body swellings. So that is uh, a classical difference so you by this i'm saying that heart attack is also not a symptom of covid 19 it's just that uh two of the symptoms they share the heart attack and COVID share thank you uh it's just that heart attack and covid 19 share at least two symptoms but actually heart attack is not a symptom of COVID-19. So far, that is what the information, available evidence is saying. But like I've said earlier, and uh, Dr. Jamil also have been also saying uh, rightly, that uh, uh, this is an evolving situation and the available evidence we have today uh, may change because of if we, uh, if we, if a superior scientific evidence is available, the information, uh, the, the information or the concept and change. But for now, heart attack and ulcer are not actually considered as signs of uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awal, for this. Uh, you hold out to Dr. Jamil. This is asking, how can I cope with stigma? All right, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very important question. Um, uh, as I, know, as I know now, COVID-19 is something that is now found in all our communities and uh, with something that uh, we should embrace and something that we should do something to uh, limit the spread. One way or the other, certain people will get infected with COVID-19. So stigma simply means some sort of uh, disapproval with uh, people that are associated with uh, COVID-19. And if you're infected, so now who usually get uh, stigma or who get uh, stigmatized with COVID-19? There are usually people that have the infection, that have the disease, or people that even recovered from the disease. There are instances of that they were treated with with COVID nineteen, and then or people that get better, they are tested and they are negative. But some people don't want to accept them. They are still sick, but then people don't want to close to them. Just COVID nineteen is just, just like any other infection. It's like like malaria, like uh, any uh, measles, like chicken pox that uh, you get the disease and uh, you can also um, uh, clear the disease from the system. You can get uh, treated or you don't have the disease from the system. So if you don't have it, there's no need for people to be uh, stigmatizing them. Another class of people that usually get stigmatized are people that travel, especially in areas that have a uh, high uh, burden of disease, like maybe in Nigeria, like in Abuja, uh, Lagos, or Kano. Uh, these areas are the that have, these are the three areas that have uh, the highest burden of disease. So whenever people come from those areas, they're usually uh, stigmatized. And then another class of people that may be stigmatized are health workers, especially those that uh, manage COVID-19 uh, cases. So how do uh, people usually uh, present with, uh, or how does um, uh, stigma manifest? They usually uh, manifest a social rejection. People don't want to associate with uh, people that have anything to do with uh, COVID-19, uh, be it maybe people that survive or health workers that are 
uh, <clears throat> managing COVID-19 patients. Or sometimes there will, there will also be denial of some certain services like treatment. Uh, in some hospitals, uh, in some places, patient, people, people with uh, COVID-19 uh, symptoms usually get rejected. Uh, this should not be so. Uh, people should not uh, reject or all those people. And then uh, there are also the last uh, form of, uh, or the last way of uh, COVID uh, sequestration of course in for COVID-19 is uh, one way is uh, <clears throat> physical violence. There are instances that uh, people attack or maybe physically attack people that have uh, COVID-19 or people that are suspected to be having COVID-19 or people, uh, this shouldn't be so. So how can we uh, cope with it? If you have the infection, the most important thing uh, they said knowledge is power. If you have the knowledge, even if somebody has COVID-19, um, if you follow the uh, normal approving uh, public health uh, measures or advice, you're not likely to get infected. Uh, wear face masks only, maintain social distances, avoid handshakes. So with that, if you can uh, institute that, you're not likely to get infected. So uh, and another thing that uh, we can help to say to avoid stigma is uh, <clears throat> education, mass education. Um, educate people uh, using social media, social conventional media, that's uh, televisions, radio, and TV. And maybe having interviews with people that survive the disease, they would uh, narrate their experience. And maybe maybe even video that are now interacting with their family members. This will help uh, individuals to start uh, uh, feeling uh, okay or easy with uh, people that uh, survive the disease. And for somebody that has disease, uh, so it needs to accept the situation. Uh, especially if you have somebody doesn't have symptoms, he can keep himself easy. He can read. He can participate in some certain um, activities. Um, he can link up with friends uh, using uh, either phone calls or video calls. Uh, he can read books. He can do so many activities so that uh, he will not be bored, maybe sitting alone, or when he's self isolating, or when he's uh, in treatment centers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Uh, the next question also goes to you, which uh, marks the end of the questions for today. Um, is asking how can we protect people at risk, age, and those with pre-existing conditions? Okay, it's not clear based on existing data and also based on uh, what is happening in our environment. There are certain people that are at higher risk of getting infected or, 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 or of having severe disease and dying from the disease. And as uh, rightly mentioned by the person that asked the question, these are the age people would advance age, and then people with pre condition uh, pre condition condition. Advanced age are people that uh, maybe usually above the age of 50, uh, 50 60. Like uh, they, there's what is called case fatality rate. That's proportion of uh, individuals that, that that are infected that die from the disease. Uh, for those that are below the age of nine, that's and children, the case fatality rate is close to zero. Hardly anybody dies from the disease. However. From the, age, uh, from the age of 60 years, the case fatality rate is around uh, 4%. 50 to 60 years is around 4%. That means 4 out of 100 persons that get infected die from the disease. Uh, and then from 70 to 79, it's around 8%. That means 8 out of 100 of people that uh, got infected between the age of 70 to 79 die from the disease. And then those above 80%, the case fatality rate is about 15%. That means about 15% of those individuals die if they get infected. 50% of that's 15 out of 100 of those individuals die if they get infected. Another risk groups are pre existing conditions, as I mentioned earlier, diabetes, heart diseases, asthma, uh, hypertension, certain uh, chronic inf infections like tuberculosis and HIV. So, how can we protect these product people? So, now that uh, we are having uh, community transmission of uh, COVID 19, these people usually need to, be, uh, need to be protected so that they will not get exposed to disease and have uh, severe disease and die from the infection. Since we know it's an outbreak, and this outbreak will not last forever. So as much as possible, let's protect them uh, during this period of outbreak so that uh, whenever this outbreak um, subsides or it goes completely, uh, people can go about uh, doing their usual activities. So how can we protect them? Uh, we should uh, isolate them. They should uh, maybe stay in a house, in a house, maybe in a secluded area in their houses so that uh, they will not be mingling with people. They should avoid going out unnecessarily to, for no essential things. So for now, elderly, those uh, elderly and those with uh, pre existing condition, especially those ones that uh, will have uncontrolled hypertension or uncontrolled okay. diabetes, or those with cancers, should avoid going to public spaces, even funeral, even for condolence, even going to market, going to market, going to meetings, uh, and other places should be avoided as much as possible. They should stay at home, and even at home, they should limit interacting with other people at home. Maybe they should be interacting with other one, one or two persons, 
However, they can be interacting with other people, of the, other members of the societies, maybe using phone calls, using text messages, or using video calls, as the case may be, but based on their own resources. And as much as possible, um, uh, usually those guys, uh, those people usually have uh, me one form of medical condition or not, uh, so we should get their medication so that they don't need to go out and get their medication. Maybe you can get maybe two or three months of their medication with them so that they have another supplies that they essentially need with them, um, close to them, so that they don't need to go out. And if they have uh, some certain uh, non-essential, even non-essential um, uh, doctor's uh, appointment should be canceled at this point. Especially maybe if they don't feel anything, like elderly, usually they go and see the doctors maybe once in a month or once in two months. So in this COVID area, because uh, in those hospitals, uh, there may be some people who are infected or in the course of going to the hospital, they may get infected as much as possible. If they don't have any uh, critical or non-essential uh, condition, they should even um, they should avoid going to even um, hospital appointment unless it is necessary. And also when they have to go out, maybe if there's some condition that warrant them to go out, they should uh, um, avoid pub uh, public transport and adopt uh, all these uh, measures that are proven to be effective. Maintain social distancing, avoid shaking hands, wear uh, face masks. And also even at home, they should wear face masks, they should disinfect all uh, their areas where they stay frequently, especially where uh, things that uh, other people commonly use, like uh, cups, uh, spoons, uh, switches, door handles, and, um, and, and etc. Things that are commonly used in those as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamil, for this elaborate uh, uh, answers. Uh, that has come to the end of our questions and answer uh, sessions uh, organized by Science Communication Hub Nigeria today. Uh, however, we will uh, hover uh, to our followers to look at some few questions uh, so that you can answer them for us. Uh, maybe. Uh, these questions will likely go to uh, Dr. Awal. Uh, Ahmad uh, Abdullah is asking, is getting vaccine for COVID-19 really visible or achievable in the next 12 to 18 months? How safe it can be? Uh, thank you so much. It's a very interesting question. Uh, I would say based on the available evidence so far, truly it's possible to have a vaccine in the next 12 to 18 months based on the available evidence and because of the the serious commitment from the scientific community for the search of the vaccine is actually uh, possible this is also of course coupled with the the realization that we don't need to go through what we call the traditional vaccine uh, uh, traditional vaccine development. Uh, we don't need to use attenuated vaccines and things like that. Uh, we can use genetic uh, vaccines, DNA and RNA vaccine. Um, actually, we are glad that it is actually this genetic vaccine that so far are leading this the race for vaccine development. And with them, I think um, based on the available data, we are really uh, hopeful that we can have a vaccine within this time period, because uh, some of them actually, I think I have read somewhere, most of them will start recruiting around uh, June, July, and then after uh, six, seven, eight months, I think we will hopefully have uh, a, a reliable result to to work on. Uh, so I think it's really possible based on the available evidence, especially with the uh, advent of uh, the DNA and RNA vaccine are actually fast tracking uh, the process. Uh, for safety, yes, uh, I would say that it's actually uh, going to be safe because all that is, in fact, that's why science is not rushing the issue. That is actually the reason why science is at all not rushing, so that we want to be sure that the vaccine that will eventually be produced is safe to everyone. Uh, okay, is at least safe for most uh, people. So that is actually part of the reason. So uh, with regards to safety, uh, is actually taken seriously into cognizance during the, the trial. So it's going to be safe. And with the information available, it's really hopeful that we can achieve, uh, we can get a vaccine by this time period. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awal. Um... The last, maybe the last questions uh, came from Yusuf Ahmad Sariki. 
He says, thank you, Dr. Jamilu. Uh, and I want Dr. Jamilu to answer this. Uh, my question is that how true is, uh, uh, is about this novel virus, as some are saying, even you recover as time goes on, it will renounce. That is, is there no total healing after being infected? So how true is it? So um, thank you very much uh, for this question. And uh, this is very important. And this is one of the uh, things that is bubbling scientists and doctors across the world. These are the things that uh, we are trying to, people are, we are trying to understand, the behavior of the virus. As, as you said, uh, the virus is a novel virus. Novel, novel in the sense that it's a, it's a very new, it's a new virus that has never been uh, seen before. And so we don't know most of its uh, characteristics. So, and, uh, uh, you said that sometimes when people have recovered from the disease, um, can they also uh, be reinfected or can have, uh, that's what is called, somebody that has disease, he may, uh, in some disease condition, if somebody has the disease, he may later have uh, that disease. That's what is called um, reinfection. That means um, after getting, after you recover from the disease, you get exposed to the uh, pathogen or the cause, organism that causes the disease and you get infected. That's called reinfected. And then there's what is called reactivation. Reactivation is when maybe there is uh, there is dormancy of the disease, like uh, uh, like in malaria. There's what is called a relapse. Uh, instinct is um, special of the plasmodium disease, like plasmodium vivax. You have the disease, and then it will stay in certain cells of the body. And after some time, sometimes after some weeks or months, then that disease will get uh, reinfected. You get um, uh, that's even after clearing one signal, blood. So in some cells, they will uh, get uh, some of them. Some of the um, parasite the cells, they will get uh, uh, reactivated, and then will cause disease. That's so called. This what is called reactivation. And then there's another concept that is called recrudescence. And in this recrudescence is when um, there are certain um, uh, the microorganism they've not, they've not been properly cleared. They they, mm -hmm. they may get, um, get um, reactivated again, and then some person may have uh, symptoms of disease. For COVID nineteen. Actually, um, uh, as we keep on saying, that there, we don't have enough information about this. But so far, what we know is that uh, there are some studies that have been done in South Korea. They found about, that about 32 patients with uh, COVID-19 that recovered, they later tested positive again well, with the COVID-19 uh, for COVID-19. However, recently, about a week or two weeks ago, there have been other studies, uh, there are other people that uh, re-examined the data, re-examined those patients, and they, what, what they found was that uh, there, it was actually an error. It was not reinfection or reactivation of the, of the, of the, of the virus. So, yeah. so far, based on the available information we have, there is no evidence that uh, people that recovered from the disease uh, can get reinfected or there is a sort of uh, reactivation of the disease or maybe the disease can be dormant in our body. However, this usually for us to get adequate knowledge, we need to study the virus closely for a certain period of time. Uh, usually before... For, for common disease condition that we have, the disease condition or the pathogens need to be studied for several years for us to fully understand uh, the uh, mechanism or the behavior of the virus. But COVID-19, because of its importance, because of the mobility and mortality, because of how it uh, uh, restricts so many activities in the world, there are so many interests and so many activities, so many research have been going on COVID-19. And so far, we've known so many things about the virus. So, so far, there is no evidence that there is uh, reinfection Somebody that get the virus can get their infected. And this is particularly very good for uh, people that are developing vaccine. So because if uh, somebody can get uh, reinfected, uh, re uh, reinfected or they can get reactivated, it may be problematic for people that are developing uh, vaccine. So, so far, there's no evidence of that. But uh, there is need for us to also continue researching. Uh, keep, keep a monitoring person that have disease, uh, person that uh, recovered from this to see whether maybe the, the dormant form of the parasite, or oh, sorry, of the virus, that may get uh, reactivated later on in that. But so far, there's no evidence that there is reactivation, and there's no evidence that uh, somebody that recovered the disease can be reactivated. However, this is not like a confirmation that uh, if you had uh, COVID-19, you are immune to um, having COVID-19 forever. Um, there is no evidence also. There's also no evidence to categorically say that if you have COVID-19 and recovered, you may not likely to get COVID-19 again. But we're hoping that um, like certain conditions like measles, like if you have measles or if you have chicken pox, you're not likely to have chicken uh, pox again. So we're hoping that for uh, COVID-19, it will be the same uh, mechanism so that uh, uh, once, uh, so that people can easily develop heart immunity 
and and people in the communities, even though even some people that are not infected will be protected because uh, there is likely no likelihood of having outbreak epidemics if a lot of people uh, in these communities have some sort of uh, immunity or protection from the disease. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamil. Uh, thank you, Dr. Awal, for these sessions. We are very uh, happy that you have answered all our uh, respondents' questions. So we uh, have come to the end of these sessions. Maybe um, tomorrow we'll continue for the house sessions. So for those of you who have questions, you can reserve and you can post it on our Facebook or uh, our YouTube channels. Uh, we will subsequently answer them in our next webinar. Um, so feel free to post your questions. Uh, we'll keep them uh, in our database and subsequently we'll answer them. Thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful day, Dr. Jamil and Dr. Awal. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, All right. Yeah.